The Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Chapter 18 Angel Clare rises out of the past not altogether as a distinct figure, but as an appreciative voice, a long regard of fixed, abstracted eyes, and a mobility of mouth somewhat too small and delicately lined for a man's, though with an unexpectedly firm close of the lower lip now and then, enough to do away with any inference of indecision. Nevertheless, something nebulous, preoccupied, vague in his bearing and regard, marked him as one who had probably had no very definite aim or concern about his material future. Yet, as a lad, people had said of him that he was one who might do anything if he tried. He was the youngest son of his father, a poor parson at the other end of the county, and had arrived at Talbothay's dairy as a six months pupil, after going the round of some other farms, his object being to acquire practical skill in the various processes of farming, with a view either to the colonies or the tenure of a home farm, as circumstances might decide. His entry into the ranks of the agriculturalists and breeders was a step in the young man's career which had been anticipated neither by himself nor by others. Mr. Clare the Elder, whose first wife had died and left him a daughter, married a second late in life. This lady had somewhat unexpectedly brought him three sons, so that between Angel, the youngest, and his father, the vicar, there seemed to be almost a missing generation. Of these boys the aforesaid Angel, the child of his old age, was the only son who had not taken a university degree, though he was the single one of them whose early promise might have done full justice to an academical training. Some two or three years before Angel's appearance at the Marlott dance, on a day when he had left school and was pursuing his studies at home, a parcel came to the vicarage from the local booksellers directed to the Rev. James Clare. The vicar, having opened it and found it to contain a book, read a few pages, whereupon he jumped up from his seat and went straight to the shop with the book under his arm. "'Why has this been sent to my house?' he asked peremptorily, holding up the volume. "'It was ordered, sir.' "'Not by me, nor any one belonging to me, I am happy to say.' The shopkeeper looked in his order-book. "'Oh, it has been misdirected, sir,' he said. "'It was ordered by Mr. Angel Clare, and should have been sent to him.' Mr. Clare winced as if he had been struck. He went home pale and dejected, and called Angel into his study. "'Look into this book, my boy,' he said. "'What do you know about it?' "'I ordered it.' said Angel, simply. "'What for?' "'To read.' "'How can you think of reading it?' "'How can I? Why, it's a system of philosophy. There is no more moral or even religious work published.' "'Yes, moral enough, I don't deny that. But religious? For you, who intend to be a minister of the gospel?' "'Since you have alluded to the fact, father,' said the son, with anxious thought upon his face, I should like to say, once for all, that I should prefer not to take orders. I fear I could not conscientiously do so. I love the church as one loves a parent. I shall always have the warmest affection for her. There is no institution for whose history I have a deeper admiration. But I cannot honestly be ordained her minister, as my brothers are, while she refuses to liberate her mind from an untenable, redemptive theolatry. It had never occurred to the straightforward and simple-minded vicar that one of his own flesh and blood could come to this. He was stultified, shocked, paralysed. And if Angel were not going to enter the church, what was the use of sending him to Cambridge? The university, as a step to anything but ordination, seemed, to this man of fixed ideas, a preface without a volume. He was a man not merely religious, but devout. A firm believer, 
not as the phrase now exclusively construed by the theological thimble-riggers in the church and out of it, but in the old and ardent sense of the evangelical school, one who could indeed opine that the eternal and divine did eighteen centuries ago in very truth. Angel's father tried argument, persuasion, entreaty. No, father, I cannot underwrite Article Four. leave alone the rest, taking it in the literal and grammatical sense, as required by the Declaration, and therefore I can't be a parson in the present state of affairs," said Angel. My whole instinct in matters of religion is towards reconstruction, to quote your favourite epistle to the Hebrews, the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain." His father grieved so deeply that it made Angel quite ill to see him. "'What is the good of your mother and me economising and stinting ourselves to give you a university education, if it is not to be used for the honour and glory of God?' his father repeated. "'Why, that it may be used for the honour and glory of man, father?' Perhaps if Angel had persevered he might have gone to Cambridge like his brothers. But the vicar's view of that seat of learning as a stepping-stone to orders alone was quite a family tradition. And so rooted was the idea in his mind that perseverance began to appear to the sensitive son akin to an intent to misappropriate a trust, and wrong the pious heads of the household, who had been, and were, as his father had hinted, compelled to exercise much thrift to carry out this uniform plan of education for the three young men. "'I will do without Cambridge,' said Angel, at last. "'I feel that I have no right to go there in the circumstances.' The effects of this decisive debate were not long in showing themselves. He spent years and years in desultory studies, undertakings, and meditations. He began to evince considerable indifference to social forms and observances. The material distinctions of rank and wealth he increasingly despised. Even the good old family, to use a favourite phrase of a late local worthy, had no aroma for him unless there were new good resolutions in its representatives. As a balance to these austerities, when he went to live in London to see what the world was like, and with a view to practising a professional business there, he was carried off his head, and nearly entrapped by a woman much older than himself, though luckily he escaped not greatly the worse for the experience. Early association with country solitudes had bred in him an unconquerable and almost unreasonable aversion to modern town life, and shut him out from such success as he might have aspired to by following a mundane calling in the impracticability of the spiritual one. But something had to be done. He had wasted many valuable years, and having an acquaintance who was starting on a thriving life as a colonial farmer, it occurred to Angel that this might be a lead in the right direction. Farming, either in the colonies, America, or at home, farming at any rate, after becoming well qualified for the business by a careful apprenticeship, that was a vocation which would probably afford an independence without the sacrifice of what he valued even more than a competency, intellectual liberty. So we find Angel Clare at six-and-twenty, here at Talbothays, as a student of kine, and as there were no houses at hand in which he could get a comfortable lodging, a boarder at the dairyman's. His room was an immense attic, which ran the whole length of the dairy-house. It could only be reached by a ladder from the cheese-loft, and had been closed up for a long time till he arrived and selected it as his retreat. Here Clare had plenty of space, and could often be heard by the dairy folk pacing up and down when the household had gone to rest. A portion was divided off at one end by a curtain, behind which was his bed, the outer part being furnished as a homely sitting-room. At first he lived up above entirely, reading a good deal, and strumming upon an old harp, which he had bought at a sale, 
saying, when in a bitter humour, that he might have to get his living by it in the streets some day. But he soon preferred to read human nature by taking his meals downstairs in the general dining-kitchen, with the dairyman and his wife, and the maids and men, who altogether formed a lively assembly, for though but few milking-hands slept in the house, several joined the family at meals. The longer Clare resided here, the less objection had he to his company, and the more did he like to share quarters with them in common. Much to his surprise, he took indeed a real delight in their companionship. The conventional farm-folk of his imagination, personified by the pitiable dummy known as Hodge, were obliterated after a few days' residence. At close quarters no Hodge was to be seen. At first, it is true, when Clare's intelligence was fresh from a contrasting society, these friends with whom he now hobnobbed seemed a little strange. Sitting down as a level member of the dairyman's household seemed at the outset an undignified proceeding. The ideas, the modes, the surroundings appeared retrogressive and unmeaning. But with living on there day after day, the acute sojourner became conscious of a new aspect in the spectacle. Without any objective change whatever, variety had taken the place of monotonousness. His host and his host's household, his men and his maids, as they became intimately known to Clare, began to differentiate themselves as in a chemical process. The thought of Pascal's was brought home to him. On trouve qu'il y a plus d'hommes originaux. Les gens du commun ne trouvent pas de différence entre les hommes. The typical and unvarying Hodge ceased to exist. He had been disintegrated into a number of varied fellow creatures, beings of many minds, beings infinite in difference, some happy, many serene, a few depressed, one here and one there bright, even to genius, some stupid, others wanton, others austere, some mutely Miltonic, some poetically Cromwellian, into men who had private views of each other as he had of his friends, who could applaud or condemn each other, amuse or sadden themselves by the contemplation of each other's foibles or vices, men every one of whom walked in his own individual way the road to dusty death. Unexpectedly he began to like the outdoor life for its own sake, and for what it brought, apart from its bearing on his own proposed career. Considering his position, he had become wonderfully free from the chronic melancholy which is taking hold of the civilized races with the decline of belief in a beneficent power. For the first time of late years he could read as his musings inclined him, without any eye to cramming for a profession, since the few farming handbooks which he deemed it desirable to master occupied him but little time. He grew away from old associations, and saw something new in life and humanity. Secondarily, he made close acquaintance with a phenomena which he had known before but darkly, the seasons in their moods, morning and evening, night and noon, winds in their different tempers, trees, waters, and mists, shade and silence, and the voices of inanimate things. The early mornings were still sufficiently cool to render a fire acceptable in the large room wherein they breakfasted, and, by Mrs. Crick's orders, who held that he was too genteel to mess at their table, it was Angel Clare's custom to sit in the yawning chimney-corner during his meal, his cup and saucer and plate being placed on a hinged flap at his elbow. The light from the long, wide, mullioned window opposite shone in upon this nook, and assisted by a secondary light of cold blue quality which shone down the chimney, enabled him to read there easily whenever disposed to do so. Between Clare and the window was the table at which his companion sat, their munching profiles rising sharply against the panes, while to the side was the milk-house door through which were visible the rectangular leads in rows, full to the brim with the morning's milk. 
At the further end the great churn could be seen revolving, and its slip-slopping heard, the moving power being discernible through the window in the form of a spiritless horse, walking in a circle, and driven by a boy. For several days after Tess's arrival, Clare, sitting abstractly, reading from some book, periodical, or piece of music just come by post, hardly noticed that she was present at table. She talked so little, and the other maids talked so much, that the babble did not strike him as possessing a new note, and he was ever in the habit of neglecting the particulars of an outward scene for the general impression. One day, however, when he had been conning one of his music scores, and by force of imagination was hearing the tune in his head, he lapsed into listlessness and the music-sheet rolled to the hearth. He looked at the fire of logs, with its one flame pirouetting at the top of a dying dance, after the breakfast cooking and boiling, and it seemed to jig to his inward tune, also at the two chimney crooks dangling down from the cotterel or crossbar, plumed with soot, which quivered to the same melody, also at the half-empty kettle whining an accompaniment. The conversation at the table mixed in with his phantasmal orchestra, till he thought, "'What a fluty voice one of those milkmaids has! I suppose it is the new one.' Clare looked round upon her, seated with the others. She was not looking towards him. Indeed, owing to his long silence, his presence in the room was almost forgotten. "'I don't know about ghosts,' she was saying. But I do know that our souls can be made to go outside our bodies when we are alive." The dairyman turned to her with his mouth full, his eyes charged with serious inquiry, and his great knife and fork—breakfasts were breakfasts here—planted erect on the table, like the beginning of a gallows. "'What, really, now? And is it so, matey?' he said. A very easy way to feel them go," continued Tess, is to lie on the grass at night and look straight up at some big bright star, and by fixing your mind upon it you will soon find that you are hundreds and hundreds of miles away from your body, which you don't seem to want at all." The dairyman removed his hard gaze from Tess and fixed it on his wife. "'No, that's a rum thing, Christiana, eh?' To think of the miles I've vamped the starlit nights these last thirty years, courting or trading or for doctor or for nurse, and never had the least notion of that till now, or feel my soul rise as much as an inch above my shirt collar. The general attention being drawn to her, including that of the dairyman's pupil, Tess flushed, and remarking evasively that it was only a fancy, resumed her breakfast. Clare continued to observe her. She soon finished her eating, and, having a consciousness that Clare was regarding her, began to trace imaginary patterns on the tablecloth with her forefinger, with the constraint of a domestic animal that perceived itself to be watched. "'What a fresh and virginal daughter of nature that milkmaid is!' he said to himself. And then he seemed to discern in her something that was familiar something which carried him back into a joyous and unforeseeing past, before the necessity of taking thought had made the heavens grey. He concluded that he had beheld her before. Where, he could not tell. A casual encounter during some country ramble it certainly had been, and he was not greatly curious about it, but the circumstance was sufficient to lead him to select Tess in preference to the other pretty milkmaids, when he wished to contemplate contiguous womankind. End of chapter 18